All right, hello everyone, and welcome to our first of two webinars with Dr. Andy DeSessa. Uh, my name is Steve Floyd. I'm one of two facilitators for tonight's webinar. Uh, the other facilitator is, of course, my wife, Lisa. Uh, first of all, a big thank you to the Math Knowledge Network for funding this event. Uh, the Math Knowledge Network is a part of the Knowledge Network for Applied Education Research, which is funded by the Ontario Ministry of Education. Also, a big thank you to Dr. George Gadnitas, who has made tonight's webinar possible. Uh, he is also the best PhD supervisor that I have ever had. Uh, he's given me an hour and a half break tonight to look after this webinar, and then I have to get right back to reading and writing. So I'm going to do that right away, George. Don't worry. Uh, in a minute or two, Lisa will be introducing our guest, Dr. Andy DeSessa, who will be pr uh, present to us his views surrounding the big picture of mathematics and computer education. Uh, I learned the other day that Dr. DeSessa is a Golden State Warriors fan, so that's okay this week. But if both our teams do well uh, in the Western and Eastern finals, then that could be a problem uh, in next week's webinar, but we will see. Um, after Dr. DeSessa's presentation, we'll have time for questions and comments from participants. Uh, feel free to include those questions and comments in the chat window. Uh, please have your microphones and videos muted during tonight's webinar. Just ensure a smooth feed. If you'd like to ask questions using your microphone or video during the question and comment period, we can uh, definitely make that possible. Just as a reminder also, we have another webinar next week. That's webinar number two, uh, May 22nd from 7.30 to 9 p.m. We'll have Dr. DeSessa back, as long as he wants to join us again, hopefully he will. Uh, and we'll be discussing the important topic of artificial intelligence and education. Uh, one final note before I pass it along to Lisa. Uh, for those on Twitter, we have a hashtag that we are using tonight, which is hashtag MKN webinars. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. I'm excited that so many of you have tuned in, and I'll now turn it over to Lisa. There we go. Can you hear me okay, Steve? <laughs> okay. Um, so, first of all, any of you who have ever met an author or someone who you've cited in your papers uh, would know exactly how Steve and I feel this evening. It's really an honor. Uh, to get to co-host this webinar, thanks to Dr. Gadamidis, as well as the Math Knowledge Web Network, um, to, especially because we have so much respect for Dr. DeSessa, and we also cite him often in our papers and presentations. So as Steve said, we're going to have a chance to hear uh, from Dr. DeSessa, and provided the technology works for us today, and Dr. DeSessa doesn't um, use too many profanities, we should be able to share that recording at a future date. Um, and hopefully I don't regret wearing my Raptor shirt <laughs> um, as well once that's up and recorded. Hopefully they'll be victorious this evening. Um, so before I introduce our special guest formally, I'll mention again, as Steve just said, that our hashtag for Twitter is hashtag MKNWebinars, and we'll use that same hashtag next week. It's always a great way to make new connections as well as to share and inspire those who are in our networks. So it's an honor for me to introduce Dr. DeSessa, who's a Cory professor at the professor rather at the Graduate School of Education at University of California, Berkeley. He received a degree in physics from Princeton and his PhD from MIT. His research interests lie in computers and education, learning epistemology, physics and mathematics, as well as programming languages for non-professionals. He has hundreds of publications papers, as well as books, including Turtle Geometry about Logo, as well as Changing Minds, just to name a couple, and he's presented all around the world. We are grateful that he'll be sharing his research and his views that have been 45 years in the making as he's worked to improve STEM education and technology. I think he'll probably tell us a little bit more about this, but even with his extensive work as a professor at the university level, one of his most surprising and informative formative experiences has been with a grade six class and um, that was a year-long project and um, that was to improve their understanding of topics that most of, a, most of us would consider to be quite challenging including calculus and physics. I know I have my own beliefs about coding and computational thinking and present and share about those often and I'm still navigating my way through this but I always like to mention it's important we look at these things through a critical lens and that we question how this will benefit our students in our own practice. So I'm excited to be enlightened and to listen to Professor DeSessa's perspective, especially given that it stands from 45 years of work and it may be a direction that many of us have not considered, but should. Despite the recent worldwide momentum, many of us know that this is not new. 
whether we agree with how, with how it's presented and pushed, it's important that we take advantage to, to push um, and push to take these steps forward. As Dr. Shasessa says, a bigger agenda. So we're aiming towards that bigger agenda. So we may see deep change in teaching and learning with long-term rewards. And I love that he also says, we will only see long-term change if we actually try and make an effort to get there. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Cory Professor Dr. Andy DeSessa. Uh, well, thank you for that very generous introduction, Lisa, and uh, thank you both Lisa and Stephen for uh, organizing the technical side of this. Okay. And, uh, uh, I, I really do appreciate it, and thanks to, to George for uh, inviting me to talk about one of my favorite uh, subjects, even though I've been thinking about it for quite a while. Um, not quite my whole career. Um, uh, I, I kind of moved into this territory a little gradually, but that's a, that's a story that uh, history that I'm not going to uh, uh, tell uh, uh, tonight. Uh, but let me let me get started if I can get my slides up looks good yep yep looks good uh, and I will oops well, that's that's good enough for now um, okay so here's here's the talk computational literacy uh, what is it what does it uh, mean i um, going to be doing a little bit of some kind of alternative uh, views of uh, the, uh, the big picture. Uh, that's where I'm at with, this, uh, with uh, this talk and this line of thinking. I also, many of you might know, do micro studies, so I hope that I have my feet on the, on the ground even if I have my I try to keep my head up uh, uh, high, looking looking across the comp complicated terrain that we um, have to navigate ahead of us. Uh, so, what's what's the big picture? Uh, what uh, are we doing? What should we do be doing? What should we be thinking about in terms of the big picture of computation and education, mathematics in particular? Uh, uh, a lot of my career has been in mathematics, even though uh, physics is probably my uh, 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 my core area. So uh, here's an outline of the talk, just so that you know what's coming. I'm going to describe the literacy model, computation as a as a literacy. It's a pretty exotic idea, and a lot of my co colleagues. Uh, uh, demonstrably don't get it so that some of that could be my fault but I think it's a I think it's a, a, a culturally uh, somewhat marginalized view largely because there are other competing uh, big pictures uh, and also uh, pictures that are not big pictures <laughs> at all but following our nose so I'm gonna uh, start this um, talk by talking, uh, by describing um, a mystery for me that took me a couple of years to solve, uh, but it's a very illuminating, uh, illuminating mystery, uh, and it concerns uh, uh, some difficulties that this, this incredible genius uh, Galileo had uh, when he started doing his work on, on motion in particular. Um, and as uh, Lisa suggested, um, I'm going to be talking about that sixth grade class, which was, um, uh, it was quite a long time ago, but it was the most fun that, uh, that uh, I ever had in my professional career over a year in terms of one research project. So, and I also think that it shows, uh, it, it gives a, a good view into uh, some of the high level and low level of computational literacy. And, uh, kind of ground those ideas as well. And uh, throughout all of my talk, I'm going to try to give you a kind of pithy sense of what this literacy model is, is really like. Uh, I, I know that the word literacy is used in lots of different ways. I was speaking to a friend the other day and he insisted that literacy was when people really didn't know anything, but we wanted to give them the grace of some kind of uh, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, fig leaf, uh, but literacy, I, I, I'm calling it what it is, literacy is a big deal, a giant big deal thing, and I'm going to try to lay that, uh, uh, lay that concept out fairly uh, systematically. So uh, then I'm going to be uh, doing a brief contrast, uh, which turns out to be a critique of this idea of computational thinking. I have had colleagues who say that, well, computational thinking is just, and computational literacy are just two different ways of describing the same thing. I think that's, I, I think that's, that's seriously mistaken. I'll try to make that point. Um, uh, 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 by talking specifically about uh, the computational thinking movement. Um, uh, and uh, one, of the, one of the lines in the um, uh, uh, computational thinking movement is what I describe as higher order thinking skills, or, or HOTS for short. And I'm going to be doing a kind of a historical critique of higher order higher order thinking skills. And there are other things uh, to complain about in computational thinking about, the, about that movement. There are also things to laud. I'm not gonna spend too much time on that, but if you want to ask, I can, uh, I can pitch in there. But um, I'm expecting that I won't get to those you might ask if you're particularly uh, uh, interested. And, and finally, just some reflections and conclusions. Uh, 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 how um, how um, uh, how I think in summary about these uh, about these issues. So um, so here's Galileo going back quite uh, <laughs> quite a long time, uh, uh, and I've I've always been a fan of Galileo's way of of teaching. It's quite quite remarkable. Um, I think the lore among uh, historians is that uh, Galileo took the, the, the sort of rhetorical forms of the day and was arguing against uh, 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 Socratic views of physics in particular, but he's also, maybe accidentally, but maybe uh, deliberately uh, prevent, uh, presenting a wonderful uh, kind of uh, learnable presentation of his ideas, accessible. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so I was pretty surprised and incomprehending of a section that appears in Dialogues Concerning Two New Sciences right at the beginning of his, what most people consider his greatest work uh, on, on motion. He presents six theorems and their proofs. And it's just a completely different form of exposition. Um, I'm gonna show you how that goes. And, uh, and it, it took me years to figure out what was going on. I'm gonna uh, try to engage you in figuring out a little bit uh, about what's going on if you, uh, if you haven't uh, read my books and papers. Uh, uh, so, um, so here's, here's, um, here are the six theorems. I'll show you a few of them just to get the sense of what's going on here. If a moving part of particle carried uniformly at constant speed traverses two distances, then the time intervals required are to each other in the ratio of these distances. You're just going to have to get used to ratios because that was the way that that was a, a, a form of the of, of the time. So you just uh, just get used to uh, ratios. Um, Here's theorem number two. If a moving particle traverses two distances in equal intervals of time, these distances will bear to each other the same ratio as their speeds. And conversely, if the distances are, are as the speeds, then the times are equal. Okay, I hope you can read through the ratio talk. If two particles are carried with uniform motion, but each with a different speed, then the distance covered by them during unequal intervals of time bear to each other as the compound ratio, that is the product of ratios of speeds and time intervals. So I'm not going to go through the whole set. Uh, but here's, uh, here's Galileo's proof of theorem number one. 
Uh, and I'm not going to go through this in great detail, so you can, you can relax. Uh, but trust me, this is difficult stuff. Um, the mathematics is not easy, uh, even with, uh, uh, for people who have a pretty good grasp of modern, uh, modern mathematics. So he's, he's doing something that is, you know, that kind of, it shows his genius in a certain way, but is very different from a lot of the rest of his, uh, of his exposition. So, so again, the question, what is Galileo doing with these six different theorems uh, and proofs, each of which is complicated? Uh, certainly, you know, although uh, Galileo wrote in Italian because he wanted to be uh, heard by the general population, this is stuff that is just, I would just say, just not accessible to the general population. So what, what's, he, what's he doing? What's he doing? So I can't do audience participation, although maybe I should, but here's, here's the solution. Uh, those theorems are all versions of distance equals rate times time. Uh, distance equals speed times time, if you uh, uh, prefer uh, the, the speed terminology. So here's, here's, the, here's the problem for Galileo. He did not know algebra. Uh, he could not write distance equals rate times time. There isn't an equal sign in any of his books that I, I'm quite sure it's not, uh, it couldn't have been there because um, algebra didn't exist. It wasn't a foible of his education growing up that he missed algebra, uh, but it simply, it simply didn't, didn't exist at that time. So, um, so, uh, distance equals rate times time. That's a pretty simple idea, and I'm going to belabor it just a little bit um, and look at how his theorems appear it, with in algebraic notation. So distance equals rate times time. Uh, Galileo spoke in ratios, so we have the ratio of the distance equals the ratio of the rates times the ratio of the, of the times. Uh, then we can uh, uh, look at the case where the rates are the same. That was theorem one, if you noticed. Uh, then the R terms cancel, leaving uh, the ratio of distance e equals the ratio of the of uh, times. Um, um, I'm not going to go through the other uh, the other theorems. Uh, theorem number four is actually just the ratio form of distance equals rate times time. Uh, so. Um, uh, so what we see is that algebra, including its notation, uh, uh, it's very important to notice that, is, is the, the secret sauce that makes distance equals rate times time and all of those permutations simple exercises for, let's say, your average high school student. Um, and uh, let's begin to look at the development of algebra as a mass literacy. So the first point is it really took about 300 years, more or less. It's very hard to mark absolutely the beginning and, and ends, but, uh, but algebra was beginning to get uh, going uh, right around when Galileo was writing up his life's work uh, toward the end of his, uh, of his life. Um, uh, Descartes and Vieta and a number of other peoples were, be were beginning to get to, uh, 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 to, get to work on, on algebra. Um, so in the first decade of the 20th century, um, I discovered that about 60% of high school students, and this is, the, this is in the United States, I don't, I have, a worldwide data for some of these statistics, but uh, it's easiest for me to get US uh, data. Um, I bet Canadian data is not that far from it. So, you know, that, that looks like, that looks pretty, pretty good around, uh, around 1900. Um, but uh, here's what happened in about 1925, uh, this fellow by the name of William Hurd Kilpatrick, who was a, uh, a, a colleague and disciple of uh, Dewey, uh, John Dewey, uh, uh, was very engaged in kind of public critique of the educational system, 
uh, some of you can probably channel that, uh, that, uh, that general view. But in this case, it took a very negative attitude toward teaching algebra. It's abstract, it's not useful, kids should be learning in the, in the context of everyday tasks, uh, they should be doing things that are interesting to them. Uh, I don't know that it caused this remarkable retrenchment as of 1955, only 25% of US students were getting algebra in, um, in, uh, in high school. Um, and uh, you know uh, that we've recovered. Uh, the uh, most recent statistics that uh, I, I could find that were uh, systematic was that in uh, 2013, we were uh, at Eight, at least 80% or above mid mid 80s was the was the idea. So so there's a time scale here, um, and um, uh, it, it, and it's a time scale that's important to keep in mind if we're going to be serious about thinking about uh, computation as a as a literacy. Um, so uh, social contest. Um, big social changes are never without contest. They're, they're, they're complex, uh, uh, often have uh, 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 rapid or slow developmental uh, phases. You saw if, even in, uh, in algebra in high school, taking that measure, there was a retrenchment between the early 20th century and the late uh, 20th century. Uh, so I'm just going to emphasize the social context con, uh, contest by looking at demographic um, uh, comparisons. And this is, again, from the National Center for Educational uh, 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 Statistics uh, data set. You can, you can look all of this stuff, uh, stuff up. Uh, you don't need to wait for me to, uh, uh, to bring any details to you. Um, so looking at basic algebra, um, strikingly, a really nice positive uh, uh, fact that African Americans, blacks in, in, in general, uh, uh, there's almost no difference between them and other demographic, demographic, uh, uh, demographic uh, groups. And uh, I, in sort of historical simplicity, I would give Robert Moses and the Algebra Project, uh, uh, that is Algebra as a Civil Right, uh, a lot of credit there. Uh, I wish I knew more about the history, but I don't think it's a, a bad thing to oversimplify in, in that way. Um, now, looking at calculus, we have a rather different uh, 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 picture. So, Asian population in the US, uh, about 43% of them take, uh, take calculus in high school. Whites, uh, it's about 16%. And actually, uh, whites in private schools are, are pretty close to the Asian uh, number. So uh, very interesting sub-story, sub-cultural stories uh, going on here. Blacks are at 6, 6%. Um, so you can make your own judgment, I, but that's a scary, that's a scary figure. Um, uh, and it's, this has been, this has been written up in, in the press. It's a, it's a notable thing and, and people are worried about it. And that's a good thing to worry about. But the, the, the general, uh, uh, phenomenon is that literacies develop slowly and you gotta watch out for things like equity. Uh, it, there's a lot of social, complicated social contest, uh, uh, contest going on here. So here's a, here's a kind of interesting uh, uh, graph of uh, the top graph is uh, illiteracy rate. So if you're thinking in terms of literacy, you got to flip the graph upside down. Um, and you see from 1500 to 1900, and you say generally it's, it's a pretty positive graph. Um, uh, by 1900 already, uh, textual literacy uh, uh, was, you know, uh, getting toward 100%, illiteracy down to about 
zero percent. But you know, there are things to <laughs> that aren't so nice about this graph. So, for example, during most of this time, uh, women are about a hundred years behind men. Okay, so just let that sink into your head. Women are about a hundred years behind men in terms of rates of uh, literacy through this time. Now, it's really nice that it's uh, essentially zero now, but uh, there are definitely things that we need to, that we need to worry about. Uh, here's just, uh, the, the bottom is just a toy statistic that I just found interesting and provocative. Uh, around 1700, the literacy rate in the United States, well, pre-United States, but in the, in the colonies, uh, in New England in particular was around 70%. Um, and England at that point was only 40%. So th this, is quite, uh, this is quite striking. Um, uh, but of course, there, there, uh, there was uh, uh, the, the male-female distinction and uh, a, a significant uh, reason that New England had such a high literacy rate was that uh, there, there weren't slaves there. Slaves were um, uh, forced to be illiterate uh, then. So uh, let me get started on my principles for computational literacies. The development of a literacy is a very complex and extended social and cultural change. Don't think that there's any way uh, out of that. Uh, I think people's intuitions are things are changing quickly. You know, uh, this is the modern age. Uh, uh, well, you know, maybe uh, history is telling us a, a different story, and if you actually get into thinking about what's going on and and we, you know how we're how we're going to get there, uh, I, I think that this is just a fact that we have to deal with. Um, uh, going back to Galileo, literacy fundamentally alters the intellectual structure of domains. So, for motion. Uh, Galileo had to do these uh, incredible backflips to say the equivalent of distance equals rate times time, you know, and he partitioned that universe into six separate theorems that deserve separate, separate proofs. Uh, but putting that all together uh, uh, is, is incredibly easy with algebra, as I said, it's kind of a, you know, uh, uh, I would think a not very difficult uh, task for a decent uh, high school uh, uh, algebra student. Um, uh, here's another uh, a point that I'll elaborate as I go, uh, go along. Uh, literacies transform particular domains differently. Now, algebra did a certain thing for uh, distance equals, you know, the, the, that part of uh, kinematics, let's say. Um, uh, but algebra has done different things for other communities, and each intellectual community needs to uh, connect in different ways to, uh, to algebra. So uh, literacies, going back to the textual literacy metaphor, uh, need a literature and the literature has to engage the differences between different differences, differences between uh, domains and how we think about them. Uh, and uh, literatures have to be diverse. Uh, that is to say, they're specific to uh, particular domains. Um, so here's a, here's a technical term, uh, remediation. Mediation is the idea that, uh, uh, for example, a representational system, algebra being a representational system, text being a representational system, you can think of your, your favorite examples. They change the way that you think and can think about a domain. And the way that uh, those uh, changes happen depends on the particular representational system. This is a this is a, a kind of an easy, I think, an easy idea to get. Um, algebra didn't change poetry very much. Algebra didn't change uh, literature very much. It didn't change uh, uh, um, history uh, very much. So we have to attend to the specifics of the representational uh, system in order to think about uh, 
changes. Okay, so now I'm going to shift gears and I'm just, just going to tell you some stories about the sixth grade class that, uh, that uh, uh, Lisa mentioned. Um, so this was, I, I think, as she said, uh, it was a year-long class and we decided to teach something like something like high school physics, more like high school uh, kinematics, uh, but without algebra and calculus, uh, a bit of a bold thing to try. Uh, so this is just to give you a sense of the kinds of things that we did. Uh, mainly this was a class in what physicists call kinematics, which is the mathematics is of motion. If you want to separate off uh, uh, um, uh, the dynamical laws, Newton's laws from the mathematics of describing motion with, uh, 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 with uh, things like uh, vectors and functions and graphs and, and so forth. So we, uh, we did topics like vectors, uh, graphing. In general, we, we uh, did work on different representations of motion, long story. Many of these things are long stories, but I'm going to have to cut much of it, uh, much of it short. Frames of reference. And finally, we did do a little bit of, you know, kind of core physics in this, uh, in this course, uh, F equals MA, uh, Newton's, Newton's laws. That's the algebraic representation of uh, Newton's laws, uh, a great accomplishment, which was to come uh, about 50 years after Galileo died. Um, so this is what you might see in terms of defining speed and acceleration uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, if you're thinking algebraically and with calculus, this is the sort of thing, thing uh, that, uh, that you see, uh, but um, that's not what these students got at all. And I'm gonna tell you quite a lot about what they did get. So this is, this is one core model that we presented them that is in a sense equivalent to uh, those, uh, those uh, uh, sets of uh, equations. We call it the tick model. Uh, the tick model is a program uh, which has, uh, at the top level, it just does the same thing yet again and again. Uh, you can think of this as speaking to an object and telling it to move uh, uh, one step at a time. Uh, uh, the, the distance, which is given the name speed here. And the, the top level loop is just to keep repeating uh, the, the tick. Uh, uh, the the action on each tick of the clock is the, is the metaphor, um, and this is the tick model for um, uh, motion with acceleration. It's it's uh, scalar, but at the top level, it's absolutely the same thing. Uh, but you now have a new variable called acceleration in addition to speed. And in addition to the, what happens at each tick of the clock is some motion, but also the speed is being changed. So acceleration is, is uh, a number that just gets uh, added, to the, added to the speed. Um, so I, I hope you see that as simple and uh, appropriable by sixth grade children because that is that is the fact uh, and this is a little bit of uh, uh, of theorizing if you like about why uh, why it's very simple uh, the completely obvious thing is another way to do this is with algebra or even more with algebra and calculus but we didn't we didn't have to uh, we didn't have to do that um, uh, we needed to teach them to program a little bit, but if you look at those programs, that is really simple stuff. That is the kind of thing that you can do uh, easily in the first two hours of experience with, uh, with, uh, uh, with programming, even with sixth grade uh, children. Now, also behind this is what I call cognitive simplicities. Uh, and that is the parsing of motion into discrete units of time is a very congenial way of thinking about motion. Um, and uh, uh, it's something that I, I'll just state as a fact, won't prove it to you, that children find 
incredibly natural. It's the way, in fact, they 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 will think about uh, think about motion. Um, they're they're clever about it. They know that things don't actually hop. So this this is uh, uh, this is for them a model, and they're pretty uh, they're pretty good about uh, knowing when things aren't you, you can't can't think about things as uh, as discrete uh, another uh, strength is that natural numbers uh, by this point in time are pretty natural to kids and they think about quantifying the world and uh, uh, one two three is 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 very very easy uh, maybe three-fifths is not or 0.66 maybe that's not but natural numbers are really are really uh, simple, and uh, the tick model uh, provides uh, uh, what I would call uh, excellent conceptual glosses for uh, concepts like speed. So uh, speed is a thing that gets added to position each tick of the clock, or um, uh, acceleration is just a thing that get, gets added to speed at the at each tick of the clock. So those are those be, uh, become uh, uh, very natural ideas uh, in the computational context. And I'll I'll give you some more detail on that in a moment. Um, another very important thing is that uh, these little programs they make motion. So they're connected to the phenomenology of motion in a way that algebra, uh, algebra is not. Um, uh, uh, an analytical view of, of uh, it provides an analytical view that is connected to the phenomenological experience of motion. That's a very uh, important thing. It's not just a simulation, but it's an analysis of motion. And we'll see how that goes uh, a little later on. Uh, so, so thinking about the future of these ideas uh, these days, you know, uh, 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 writing programs for dynamical uh, simulations of weather or satellites or uh, uh, global warming, that, that's, uh, that's a big thing. And we're getting started right, uh, right on, on that path very early on. Uh, now, here's, uh, here's a thing that was core to our planning. Uh, uh, which was just to get uh, uh, these children engaged with the, with the subject matter. And programming of motion uh, was a wonderful seed for kids to get going and writing basically video game style uh, things. That was a, a super great success of this project was that, that kind of um, uh, personal engagement and fun that kids had with it. Um, so I'm um, going to do a little bit more detail on thinking about the tick model as a foundation, a conceptual foundation for getting to calculus. Um, and so here's a, here's an example. This is I'm going to jump ahead in in the course. I'm not going to go uh, linearly through it. Uh, but we, when we got to studying graphing, here's a um, here's a problem that you might find in a in a high school course. There's a graph of position versus time, and the question is just to read qualitatively velocity off of that graph. And uh, I'm sure many of you know that there's a huge literature on how difficult graphing is for uh, for students, and uh, they always confuse you know, uh, speed with distance, and there, there's a lot, there's a big, big sort of uh, 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 literature on student misconceptions uh, in graphing. It's not easy. But here's, here's what our kids did spontaneously, and we didn't, we didn't even have to teach them this, although we exercised with them, uh, exercised them on it, because not everybody gets it all instantly. Uh, but, um, uh, 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 I can talk about one particular student who looked at this graph and said, and said, well, it's going one more each time, and then it goes the same amount. So he's looking at the graph, parsing the increasing speed part of it, and the, and the constant speed 
uh, part of it. And he's thinking about it in terms of this little, this little tick machine underneath where there are just these, these uh, numbers are changing or they're staying the same. And he sees that process in this, in this continuous uh, graph. And notice he's using the language of one more each time, thinking about it as a, as a, as a discrete model uh, e even if e even if he's seeing here something that appears uh, continuous, so here's a here's a discovery of uh, one student, uh, Amy, and I was in the class uh, the day that this happened. Um, uh, Amy uh, was looking at the relationship of uh, speed to distance and acceleration to speed and said, well, why don't I invent something that adds to acceleration? What would, what would that be like? Um, uh, and she, that's, to a physicist, that's called jerk. Uh, that's not the language that's used in, in, in Europe. I don't know what, uh, what the word for the third derivative is. Uh, in Canada, maybe you follow the U.S. I, and I bet mathematicians have a different term for it than physicists as well. But to a physicist, the third derivative is um, is um, jerk. She's got the idea of uh, derivatives of derivatives. Uh, she had uh, a really fun time trying to control motion by controlling jerk. They had been controlling uh, position and velocity and acceleration and making different uh, sort of patterns of, of motion. Uh, but it turns out that the third derivative, you should have this experience yourself, is really hard. And you have to think really hard in order to uh, control that motion. Things get out of hand. So, so that was an exploration that she did. And uh, it's an example of uh, these models kind of taking root feeling personal, imagining that they might be a little, uh, a little different, and it's sort of uh, very different than what you find in standard um, uh, classes uh, that might be based on algebra or, uh, or calculus. So, uh, so now I'm gonna jump back in time to earlier in the course when we first began introducing this idea of um, uh, graphical representations of, uh, of motion. Uh, we did not show them graphs. Uh, this was, in fact, uh, the day in the curriculum where we said, oh, right, we'll start a graphing unit. And this, was a, this was a full year course, so we were always behind, and, and this was pretty much literally the day before we were supposed to start teaching graphing. What should we do? And I suggested, well, let's just ask them to draw to, to draw a picture that they think is explanatory. And the uh, uh, teacher was very accommodating. In, in my group, what teachers say in the end goes. We, we don't force them to do anything that they don't want to do. But she was accommodating, and her attitude was, well, we'll see what they, what they know about uh, graphing, at least. And that'll be a nice, easy way uh, into it. Um, uh, well, so right away, um, Charlie had this idea. He said, well, you know, we should just write down, and he wrote on the board, uh, a, list of, uh, a list of speeds, um, you know? And that, that gives you a nice, uh, a nice uh, uh, picture of uh, how the, 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 the motion goes. Uh, well, this isn't what the, uh, the, the teacher wanted to do, so she started, um, telling them, no, no, I doesn't mean pictures. Let's keep those numbers out of it. I just, I just want pictures. But, but Charlie was was going, and he said, uh, while she, uh, while she was talking, he said, well, but and you could also add up all those speeds, and then you could get the distance from that. Okay, so so what a nice idea. Um, uh, I'm just going to sit on that one, but uh, but I will tell you that that. Uh, let's invent a picture that explains motion was one of the most exciting things of this most exciting project of, of mine. I'm not going to talk about that here, but uh, it turns out that kids are really good at designing representations and, uh, and 
And graphing isn't the first one that they think of. Uh, in fact, sixth grade students just don't think of graphing. Uh, they probably have never been introduced to it. So here's, here's a systematization of Charlie's insight. Um, and by the way, what, what you're seeing in terms of variables and programs is a language uh, that uh, we develop uh, for these kind of educational purposes called Boxer. And everything is a box, so a box is a variable, a list is a, is a box, uh, programs are boxes. Uh, so it's, it's very graphical in that sense. And um, uh, we took the uh, concept of, of function to be represented in, the con in this context by lists. Okay, it's quite a nice representation of function. It's nothing like algebra, uh, but it's a thing that, that the students can get their heads around very easily. You know, they see it, they see it. And, and so uh, uh, teaching the idea that you make a list of positions or speeds is not something that needs to be taught. That, that's obvious to them uh, when they get to uh, programming motion. So uh, number list rather than algebraic expression, expression as a core representation of functions. And these, these relationships um, uh, were uh, more, than, more than latent, really uh, easily came to the front uh, in, in this little classroom culture. Charlie started it by saying, well, I, you know, uh, uh, I, I can just add up speeds to get positions. So speed is the thing that adds to position. And similarly, if you just take the difference between, uh, if, if speed is the thing that increments position, then subtracting uh, positions will give you speed. And that's, that's almost, almost completely obvious to students. And similarly, there's this nice relationship, the same relationship between uh, speed and uh, acceleration, that you can move from one list to the other list with these very, very simple uh, operations. So in case you don't recognize it, that is the discrete version of the fundamental theorem of calculus, that derivatives and in integrals are inverses. Um, so you can stew on that a little bit in case it's not obvious to you. Um, so let's, let's go back to uh, those uh, dispiriting uh, 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 figures on who gets uh, who gets calculus. Uh, well, if this kind of thinking about motion, you can think of it as a pre-calculus as you like. Uh, if you can get started and pretty easily in the sixth grade, what might students be doing in high school? So you you can imagine that things uh, would be a lot easier even with the curriculum that we have now in high school, uh, but. Uh, I think a more radical uh, idea is that for many students, uh, it, it might be quite legitimate to replace algebraic calculus uh, by the tick model and, uh, and, uh, and related ideas. So um, that is always controversial, and I'll let you ask questions if you find that to be, uh, 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 to be controversial. Okay, so let's, let's go back, and I'm adding to my list of principles for computational literacies, is this idea of reformulation, uh, designing knowledge based on cognitive simplicity. So the example here is designing an understanding of motion in terms of discrete time and in terms of natural numbers and lists of numbers. Uh, those are, uh, so to put that kind of in a nutshell, you can say speed is not the ratio of infinitesimals or the limit of some ratio, but it's just this small number that plays a very particular role that's easy to understand, it's easy to see in a simple program that moves objects, uh, objects around. So that gets the idea of kind of the cognitive basis of, uh, uh, of some of the different things that we did and some of the things that hold promise for uh, future uh, computational literacies. Um, I talked about remediation, about the specific roles of representational systems uh, in, um, in changing uh, the learnability uh, and uh, the uh, 
uh, uh, you know, the, the, just the times when these ideas can be introduced. Uh, but remediation and reformulation are, I think, two distinct things that are uh, especially powerful if we put them in combination or if we're lucky enough uh, and motion is a nearly ideal case uh, that the, the mediation, uh, remediation by itself uh, supports the reformulation that is thinking about emotion uh, uh, in, dis in discrete time. Okay, so um, I just want to break out vectors for uh, discussion. Uh, we taught vectors. Um, when we originally wrote the proposal to do this work, uh, uh, the National Science, this is of course an oversimplification, but it's not too far from what actually happened. The National Science Fa Foundation told us that vectors are sim simply developmentally inappropriate. So you got this nice technical term, vectors are hard, and if you put it in the wrapper of de developmentally inappropriate, then it's just obvious that you don't know what you're, you're doing. So uh, we got a proposal rejected because of that. There were other things that they had to complain about, but that really was a, a, core, a, a core complaint. Uh, but we're sitting here uh, thinking about uh, all of the conceptual and pragmatic advantages of dis discrete time models and functions as lists. Um, and um, we thought we could do vectors uh, actually quite well. But we, we took them out of the proposal, uh, but we taught them anyway. Um, uh, and so I want to show you how vectors appeared to our students. Unfortunately, I won't be able to actually show you programs, a little too tricky to navigate two different programs at the same time. But uh, in our system, this is, this is what vectors appear like. Uh, it's a box just with an arrow in it, and you can just drag the tip of the arrow around if you want to change, change the, the, uh, the vector. So they're live things in your world in the same way that you can just type a number, you can press a key, it's even easier, one key and you've got a vector and you can drag it around to be anything that you like. Um, and the uh, vectors are actually objects in the programming language. So you can write an expression like, well, adding two vectors. Uh, so uh, vector number one, you know, I'm gonna add vector number two, and I can uh, tell the system, it's actually just a double click to execute that, and you get the resultant vector. Uh, uh, so it's as, as simple as, uh, as you, you can manage. Um, and here's the, here's the vector tick model. You have a vector velocity, a vector acceleration. You have the standard top level, just keep doing tick over and over and over again. And you move according to the velocity instead of number one. It has a direction, which might be uh, uh, you know, in, in, in any uh, compass heading. Uh, and then the second step is the same one. Um, Increment velocity by uh, by the acceleration. It's just syntactic difference. I should probably just fix this uh, slide. You can you can write it in the same way, but it's the same idea. If you can add numbers, you can add you can add vectors, and here uh, velocity gets incremented by the uh, by the uh, uh, acceleration. So here's what happened with vectors. Um, uh, we were um, a little caught off guard that uh, the reviewers of our proposal were convinced that uh, students uh, could not possibly learn vectors. So we had actually prepared a curriculum. It turned out that essentially all that, that is specific activities, specific, you know, talking about these things, uh, uh, that sort of thing. We had lots, lots of uh, exercises to help students understand vectors, but mostly, it wasn't, it wasn't necessary. They just uh, got into using them. And that's, that's this, uh, this next point. Students, students spent a lot of time with, uh, with vectors. Um, uh, it was one of the favorite topics of the sixth grade students. 
uh, really quite remarkable, the relationship between this difficult thing that high school students don't get and college students barely get, and yet put in phenomenal, phenomenological form, uh, put in terms that the students could make their own, um, uh, they just they they they, uh, they had a good had a good time with uh, with vectors, uh, and in particular a very particular thing, um, uh, the students used vectors as user interfaces devices for computer games that they invented and wrote. So, for example, uh, one student wrote uh, a, a a game which was a boat struggling to come into a dock without crashing, uh, crashing into the, the, the dock, but the tide uh, was kind of randomly going in and out, so you had to adjust your, uh, your, your, the strength of your motor and the direction in order to, uh, in order to dock without, uh, without crashing. And the interface to that was just, uh, uh, was just a vector, which was, uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly how he thought of it, but it was, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the motor uh, points you in a, in a certain direction and pushes you with a, with a, certain, a certain speed. Um, they had had um, um, uh, compositions of motions and relative motion by this time, so that was, that was an easy idea. And, uh, and, and he, he made this game, which turned out to be really quite easy. The hardest thing was making a random vector, not, not that hard. Uh, so thinking about the magic in a nutshell, how was it that these sixth grade students learned, learned vectors without a, uh, without a problem? Um, uh, it, vectors became phenomenologically live, something that they could uh, uh, could I'm sorry, uh, I'm getting close to the end of my time. Um, uh, so, uh, so they could, they could play with vectors, vectors were useful for them, and, uh, and they therefore, the magic of time, they just spent a lot of time with vectors. Uh, so I want to add one more principle uh, for computational literacies, and then we'll review and, and close. Uh, revitalizing the ecology of learning activities, uh, both in terms of the substance, what they are learning about, about vectors. Vectors are two numbers that you add. That's one thing, uh, one way of thinking about it. But uh, vectors as control, Ways of controlling motion—that's a different. That's a different thing, and uh, I, I call that a substantial thing. But also, uh, revitalizing learning activities uh, for engagement—that's a very high priority uh, for me. Something that I'm uh, aiming to work uh, more on in the not too distant future. Uh, so, uh, break this down into pieces: reduce or eliminate small algebra-based simple quantitative problems that mostly don't help students get the concepts that they need to uh, get. Much greater emphasis on phenomenology and explanation. Um, and, uh, and this is something that we added into the course. Uh, uh, we gave them time to do a lot of their own work, uh, uh, engagement-oriented uh, work. And, uh, although there were a lot of things that they did, you can think of writing computer games as, as a canonical thing. Um, and a, a sort of seemingly little thing, but we've seen it in a lot of other uh, of our computer-based courses, much greater opportunity for kind of intellectual excursions where um, the example that, examples that I've already given you is Amy's idea, if you can add something to position or to velocity, then why uh, can't you uh, add something to acceleration and see how that goes? Uh, and Charlie's idea that he, that he went on to elaborate, uh, well, you can always add up the, the, the speeds and you get, you get the distance. Um, so um, I'm going to have to go through this quickly. 
Um, there is a, a huge movement, I would say, it's a little difficult to know exactly what to call it, uh, uh, computational thinking. And I want to talk about computational thinking. And it's, it is just a big deal in case you don't know. Uh, there's something like a hundred million dollars of funding in the National Science Foundation for computational thinking. Arguably, this idea of computational thinking catalyzed the national curriculum in the United Kingdom. And as usual, the U.S. is a much more complicated story. I'm not going to try to uh, parse that out in any detail. Uh, but Jeanette Wing uh, is the key actor, um, uh, computer scientist, originally from Carnegie Mellon. She, Mellon, she uh, uh, came to be a, a, a director at the National Science Foundation, and she wrote this series of papers where she talks about this idea of computational thinking. And she described it in many different ways. It's thinking like a computer science involves solving problems, designing systems, understanding human behavior by drawing on the concepts fundamental to computer science. So it's, it's kind of you know, uh, an, an imperialist view of the world. Computer scientists know how to do these things better than other people. But right in the midst of her rhetoric and constantly and with very high priority, she has this, this version of the story, higher order think, thinking skills, computational thinking represents a universally applicable attitude and skill set everyone, not just computer scientists, would be uh, eager to learn and use. And she illustrates this skill set with things like uh, uh, divide and conquer, planning, design and representation, and abstraction is her constant and favorite example of what computer scientists know that everybody should learn by learning programming, by you learning computer science, doing computer science things. So I tried to do this really quickly. This idea that there are these general skills, higher order thinking skills, I call them, that can be cultivated in particular disciplines and, and give you uh, general uh, skills and capacities uh, has a long history. And so here's Plato. Those who are by uh, nature good at calculation are, as one might say, nationally sharp in every other study. And those who are slow at it, if they're educated and exercised in this study, nevertheless improve and become sharper than they were. Uh, so jump ahead many centuries, in the early part of the 20th century, there was this uh, uh, psychological study called mental discipline or faculty psychology. And it's the same general story. The words change a little bit, but it's the same general story. Uh, faculty psychology uh, says that there are a diverse, powerful set of general skills, quickness, attention, discrimination. I'm taking those from, uh, from that psychological literature. Literature, not sharpness. It's, they're a little different, but uh, same general idea. Can be improved by immersion in a select set, selected set of disciplines like mathematics or studying Latin. Uh, now, in the early, uh, 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 toward the end of that movement, or at least as the simple story goes, Edward Thorndike did a, a, a massive empirical study that showed, as far as he could tell, that these things, that this, this just didn't happen. Uh, so here's what he said in 1924, the intellectual values of studies, that is disciplines, should be determined largely by the special information, habits, interests, attitudes, and ideals by which they, demonst uh, which they demonstrably produce. The expectation of any large difference in general or in general uh, improvement of the mind from one study, that is discipline, uh, to another, uh, uh, rather than another seems doomed to disappointment. Um, and I'm, I think I'm just gonna, there's more interesting theoretical detail here, but I think I'm just gonna uh, skip that. Um, so some of you are probably old enough to remember the boom in problem solving in the 70s, 70s and 80s and into the 1990s, starting with George Polia and How to Solve It, the book and written in 1995. Uh, but um, the, so the idea was to teach general skills at solving. Uh, Polia was interested in mathematics in particular, and a lot of the problem solving movement went on in mathematics. So here's some of the things that 
that uh, Polya told us that we should learn. Uh, divide and conquer, planning, design a representation. He to also talked about the importance of notations. Uh, and he talked about abstraction in, uh, in terms of generalization. So just in case you don't notice, uh, I'm gonna flip back to Wing's higher order think thinking skills. It's, you know, this subset of list is virtually identical, although I did change the word, uh, words a little bit. Um, so um, my pithy sum summary of problem solving is basically it didn't it didn't take over the world. Um, uh, same fate as faculty psychology. Uh, we can talk more about that. Some of you have uh, lived through this and and uh, maybe still experience problem solving as a as an important trend. We can talk about that. But uh, I, I'll just assert very quickly because I need to move on that. Uh, it, it, it didn't really work. Um, so, uh, asking Jeanette Wing, uh, what makes your list different or better than Polya's? Why do you think the program will work better now than before? Uh, what is your respect? Well, this is this is a little bit of the theory that I skipped over. The the fact that uh, uh, you know, uh, Thorndike had this idea. These skills, it's it's a it's you know they sound like they're a thing. But in fact, there are many, many things. Um, really interesting uh, critique of why thinking skill, skills don't work, or at least are very hard to uh, to learn. And I, this, this is a particularly puzzling thing. Why does Jeanette Wing think that computer science can arrest abstraction away from other disciplines like mathematics? That's a really puzzling question for me. So, um, so higher order thinking skills is an ancient, persistent, and psychologically powerful mean, perhaps impervious to the results of scientific scrutiny, that provides a central, central pillar of face value to computational thinking. But as you can see, uh, there's a complicated history of higher order thinking skills, and mostly it doesn't, it doesn't seem to, uh, to work. Um, uh, there's a, a house of cards here that uh, needs some needs some attention. Okay, so uh, I'm going to skip other critiques and just sum up. A review and reflection, just to go back through the principles. The growth of a literacy is a complex and very extended social and cultural pro process. No way of getting around that. Uh, literacies reorganize intellectual domains and you can just think back to Galileo and his complicated theorems become this simple simple equation easy for uh, students to uh, uh, to manage uh, but the generalization is really important that that uh, that uh, literacies reorganize intellectual do domains I, I paid attention to the fact that uh, uh, that um, change of representation is a, can be a very powerful thing, and computational uh, computations properties as a representational system will be fundamental in seeing where uh, uh, how computation can become a, a literacy. I talked about this theoretical idea of reformulation, finding uh, uh, finding uh, ways of engaging. Uh, kind of the natural intelligent, intelligence of, of children. Some of you will be very familiar with this, uh, this idea. It's, it's, not, it's still not penetrated very far into the uh, educational establishment. And finally, revising and revitalizing the fabric, fabric of learning activities, just to pick out again a key point there, engagement uh, with students will be very different. So last words. I don't think anybody can design or specify exactly what a computational literacy eventually will, will entail. You can argue about that if you like. Uh, but my, my advice is just get used to the fact that this is a long haul, uh, very complicated, multifaceted uh, uh, process. Uh, so, final words, computational literacy represents a powerful take on the big picture of computation's potential effects in education, which has both scientific and practical advantage over other views. Keeping an eye on that big picture can be highly consequential over the long term. Uh, uh, doing things that, that really have true demonstrable uh, cumulative power monitoring the state of our accomplishments, are we really moving toward 
a literacy, if, if you buy into that idea, uh, then what we look at in terms of our successes and failures are, are quite different. And uh, maybe, maybe uh, we need activists uh, uh, like uh, um, uh, uh, Moses with respect to algebra as a civil right. Uh, filtering out noise and distractions from the big picture, and I'm not going to name names there. Uh, and that is my presentation. So thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. DeSessa. Um, we had said at the beginning of the webinar, and, and we had been uh, discussing the webinar beforehand, that we'd be taking a look at the big picture of computers and education. Uh, and you've certainly taken us through that, through the big picture. Uh, we've got a lot of interesting um, insights and questions through the chat windows and a couple that have been sent to us uh, privately, some shy participants, I guess, uh, who wanted us to ask a few questions. So I'm assuming you're okay, Dr. DeSessa, just continue on with some questions. Yes, absolutely. Perfect. Thank you very much. The first question actually um, comes from someone who isn't, wasn't able to be here tonight, but we had promised that we'd get this question asked. Uh, this is from Peter Skillen. Peter is, uh, he couldn't join us tonight, but he's a retired educator in Ontario. Uh, he continues to work on a number of initiatives related to computers and coding and programming in K-12 education. Um, he says that Paul Levinson, as referenced by Derek de Kirkhove in The Skin of Culture says, the addition of a drop of blue dye to a glass of water results not in blue dye plus water, but in blue water, a completely new reality. De Kirchhoff indicates that Marshall McLuhan and others pointed out that the inculcation of the habit of literacy results not in a pre-literate world plus readers, but in a literate world, a new world in which everything is seen through the eyes of literacy. So I know you had mentioned at the end of your talk that as we try to think forward through the long haul at what this might look like at the end, that that's a difficult thing to do. Um, but Peter is asking, uh, when will we see students thinking differently as a result of the ubiquitous presence and use of computational tools? Will we ever have a computational literacy land in the same way that Seymour Papert had wanted a math land? And in terms of computation, will we one day have blue water and what would that look like? Uh, that's a challenging collection of questions. Um, uh, so the, I'll parse out a few pieces. That would be great. <laughs> uh, will, will we ever enter this, uh, this world of ubiquitous computation in the same way that um, uh, that we see textual literacy everywhere, um, kids reading comic books, uh, uh, people writing notes to themselves, uh, people writing books for other people of all different sorts. Are we, are we ever going to get there? That's a really tough question, right? Uh, I, I think we can get there. I don't see any reason why we can't get there. And I think a, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, a lot of the output, uh, by working, uh, uh, toward a computational literacy will definitely be valuable um, uh, in the shorter term. So I, I am very confident that I can teach sixth grade students about motion. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's for sale. You know, anybody <laughs> for free, actually, uh, give it away. Uh, uh, you know, so um, there are niches. Uh, we, we had this nice experience of, doing this course. And then I was working with a group of people at the University of Wisconsin, and uh, they, they had also been working with teachers for many years, and the teachers were totally panicked because all of a, stu a sudden, Wisconsin said, oh, you've got to put motion into your, uh, your sixth or seventh grade curriculum. And no help whatsoever uh, in terms of uh, what, what they could do. Uh, uh, so the teachers were pretty panicked, as usual, they're, they're on the line, but nobody's giving them really much help. So I, I'm not going to say we solved their problem, but we certainly could give them things to do, very reliable activities, set goals for them, 
uh, talk to them about you know what kids can understand about motion, what kids find interesting uh, about motion. So that's a that's a you know on the scale uh, of of a literacy, that's a that's a little thing, but it's not that far away in these particular niches. Now you know uh, what does the curriculum look like across the board and across long long time scales um you know i i i speculated a little bit about well you know uh algebra and calculus in high school could look very different even not there as a, as a possibility and and everybody it might turn out that people are, are happy with that maybe scientists always need calculus but uh, does everybody does everybody uh, need calculus, or is this discrete version of calculus uh, good uh, good enough? So you know, it's kind of the sixty four thousand dollar question uh, 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 here, and I find that people who theorize about literacy don't can't answer for me the question about you know can this become a literacy. Uh, so it, it, maybe it's a cop out, but I think we we just have to try. Uh, as I said, I think you know even uh, failing the grand program, uh, a lot of good uh, uh, can come of this. So uh, let me just give you. So there is no literature that helps me understand whether computation can become a literacy. Mm -hmm. And I'll just give you. So I, I is just Marshall McLuhan. Uh, so I, whoever asked the question, does Marshall McLuhan answer that question? Uh, I think I think not. He was working with the uh, with uh, uh, the media of the day, and if uh, I, I think if we'd asked him, maybe maybe he would have something to say. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I would trust it because uh, uh, because he he didn't really think that much about revolutionizing revolutionizing math and science education. He didn't think about the particular characteristics of computation. So, so the example, just to, as an indication, uh, I, I went up to a friend who studies literacy. And, uh, and there, there is a history of literacy, but it's not theoretical to the point that we can say that, well, this is a good prospect for literacy, or this is not a good prospect. And so the question, the question I put to my, uh, my literacy studies friend is, can computation become a literacy? Just like that. And she said, well, is it a representation? And I said, sure, it's rep representation. And she said, well, then it can be a literacy. And I, I think that, that I, you know, I don't mean to demean my colleagues, but that's, you know, if you're, if you're looking at literacy as a widespread, you know, uh, uh, change in the world, um, uh, the, the, the blue water world, um, uh, I, I don't, it's, it, you know, it's necessarily going to take a long time. Uh, and we're going to have to adjust our views of, of what it is along the way. People will do things that we're all going to be surprised with, and it'll become it'll become integrated in in into the blue water. But that's the best that I can do. Uh, you know, the question that nobody knows the answer to uh, is, is my reaction to that. Well, I like your message. We, we may not know what it looks like in the end, but we can certainly try to get there. And I recognize a lot of the names that have tuned in tonight. And these are people who are tr trying to get us there. So that's a good thing. That's a good message. I'm going to pass it over to Lisa, who has uh, another question for you. Okay. Uh, Dr. DeSess, I'm wondering uh, what role you feel creativity will play in computational literacy. I, 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 I don't have anything uh, more to say than uh, that is incredibly important. That uh, people need to find computation personally meaningful and uh, you know and a liberating uh, a liberating uh, feature uh, in in much the way that uh, that uh, if you think about. Uh, uh, Paulo Freire and uh, literacy for uh, for uh, for revolution, you know. But we saw we saw small things like that, not 
and that is not culture-wide things. They were not small in the students' minds or in the students' experience, but uh, but their ability to program and make things that they were interested in just unleashed a, a tremendous creativity. Um, I, I could tell you dozens of stories. I may, I, maybe I'll leave it abstractly. Uh, okay, I'll tell you one more story about uh, about uh, what the kids did. A couple of a couple of the boys in the class decided that they wanted to make a graphing adventure game. Uh, and uh, I'll tell, the, tell you the shortest possible version of the story. So they wanted to uh, uh, have this adventure game where people, uh, players had to read graphs in order to solve problems as they went along. And this was so obviously a sixth grade boys thing. Uh, so when if you uh, if you chose the the right graph, you got a congratulations, but maybe some snarky uh, comment. And if you didn't solve it, then you were degraded. <laughs> not not a thing that it was really exciting to me. But it, these kids were just having a really good time inventing incredibly terrible ways to die if you didn't solve <laughs> solve the problem. <laughs> So, you know, it, it's their culture, right? I mean, the teacher did a marvelous job of kind of negotiating what was fair to do uh, in, in, in class. I, I, I can go on and on. The, the school became kind of a locus, an interesting locus of computational uh, literacy. Um, uh, kids taught each other to program in the school, and there was a there was an after-school club uh, got going. The kind of thing, you know, there, there was something really remarkable about this school or the teacher. Uh, not everything was hunky-dory at that school, but, uh, but uh, quite a remarkable thing uh, happened there where, where we got, you know, we got glimpses of what a computational literacy uh, 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 could, uh, could be. So it's a long haul. Uh, but they're, they're marvelous things adjacent to where we are now, too. Yeah, I think many of us have seen that, um, what you're talking about, what you're describing in the classroom um, when we've um, managed to integrate programming. Stephen, do you want to? Yeah, so we were, we were going to go with one more question. I was just going to wait a few, a few seconds here to see if there's anybody, um, any of our participants that wanted to ask any questions. They're welcome to... Um, turn their video on or their microphone or mention something in the chat. Uh, I won't wait too long, but just give someone an opportunity to kind of put their hand up if they would like, if they have any questions. Otherwise, I do have, uh, have one more for you. All right, so I'm going to conclude with one, uh, one final question here, and then we will wrap up. Um, Dr. Sess, I'd like to ask, uh, on page 16 of your paper, uh, you had mentioned the following, a true computational literacy will without doubt disrupt current assumptions and cultural ruptures will appear in the process. So can you explain what some of those cultural ruptures might be, uh, why they'll arise, possibly how they'll be resolved? Can you identify any of these possible cultural disruptions uh, that are maybe taking place today? Um, are you a disruption perhaps? Are you disrupting us to make us think about these things? Uh, so what are exactly are these uh, possible or potential cultural ruptures that might result? Well, quite, quite a lot of them. I, some of this is just looking at the history of other, of, of other literacies. And the, you know, the, the, the idea that women should be literate too, the idea that it was pre really pretty evil thing to do to withhold literacy from, uh, you know, from, uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from slaves. Uh, so the history, you know, any, you know, you know, you kind of know just by looking at any of these, uh, any of these, uh, uh, at the growth of, of uh, literacies, uh, that uh, things, things are going to be complicated and people are going to be arguing and some people are going to say, be saying, well, that's a really stupid idea. Who, who needs to, who needs to program? And, uh, one of the one of the little revolutions that I hope to uh, hope to see is uh, a transformation in the attitude toward students, not as 
poor, helpless individuals that need, all, need our help constantly. We need to tell them exactly what to do in order to, in order to learn things, but to see children and high school students and like by the time we get to college it's still kind of infantilizing till maybe your senior project uh, so uh, that's going to be that's going to be you know a big discontinuity where where teachers and society will do a lot more trusting and uh, and uh, and allow students uh, a, a lot more uh, a lot more freedom you know and, and it's going to be challenging some people are going to say as they have, uh, okay, so you're telling me that we should just set kids free and they will do uh, all wonderful things and, and you just give them, just give them a computer that has vectors on it and they'll, they'll learn these things. Well, no, that's not, that's not what I'm saying, uh, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, these are negotiations between uh, that, you know, teachers and students, uh, we all always have when, uh, when we have uh, when we have uh, different goals, but I think the uh, I think that that's one big change. Uh, trusting students, um, designing ed designing educational experiences so explicitly so that students are engaged, that being as high a priority as the instrumental uh, I idea that uh, they can learn better or faster or earlier. That's okay, uh, but really, there's a bigger transformation uh, uh, happening. So uh, that that's that's kind of an easy example. Uh, the attitude toward programming is just going to is just going to change. I mean, now you just look through these cycles. I've been through forty or fifty years of this. You look through these cycles. All of a sudden, coding is how you get a job. Okay. And everybody knows that coding is the way that you get a job, and that's how that's how programming is construed and sold, and uh, especially in the United States. Not interestingly, not so much in other places uh, uh, in the world. Well, you know, coding's uh, here's another way of thinking about coding. Well, everybody should know computer science. That's kind of the, uh, a, a wing-like uh, a version of this story. Uh, and you know, I'm you know I want to teach physics and math and biology and and writing uh, with with computational media and you know to the extent to which programming is valuable, um, you know I I will in, in, incorporate it, but it's not it's not for me and and in itself. Our sixth grade students, we spent two whole weeks. That is eight days with 40 minutes a day with these students teaching them programming and they complained bitterly that that was way too much time why did we why did we why did we spend so much time it's much better to learn while doing all these fun things that we did later on uh, so so programming uh, is an another another line of disruption will be viewed as something that's simple and everybody can do and maybe maybe there are professional versions of it but you know nobody nobody is really too worried about that in, uh, in the early well, fantastic thank you very much and like i said that's a message that uh uh we've had about what is it 28 30 participants tonight those of uh the names that i recognize those are kind of the messages that they're taking home to students and the things that they're doing um, so it's really nice to hear kind of your perspective and your take on it. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have tonight. Uh, I want to say a very big thank you uh, to Dr. DeSessa. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, thank you for sharing your research and insights into the big picture of computers, mathematics, and education. Uh, once again, thank you to the Math Knowledge Network for funding this event. The Math Knowledge Network is a part of the Knowledge Network for Applied Education Research, which is funded by the Ontario Ministry of Education. Uh, a big thank you to Dr. George Gadanitis, who's made tonight's webinar possible. Uh, if you enjoyed tonight's webinar, please join us for webinar number two, so that's next week. Uh, and actually, if you didn't enjoy tonight's webinar, please enjoy, please join us anyways. Not that you wouldn't have enjoyed it, but uh, tell all your friends, tell all your colleagues. Uh, on Wednesday, May 22nd, from 7.30 to 9, we will have Dr. DeSessa back with us, and we'll be discussing artificial intelligence and education. Um, with the increasing progress made by industry in developing AI tools and processes, we're seeing calls to bring an educational focus to AI. 
Let's explore what might be on the horizon by looking at the role of AI in education, both as a tool and as an object of study. What are some examples of AI in education? How might AI transform teaching and learning? Uh, what mathematics knowledge underpins some of the work on AI, and how does this knowledge mesh uh, with existing curricula? Some intriguing questions about an important technology. So please join us next week. Uh, tell all your friends and colleagues. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Lisa, who always likes to have the last word. So it's all yours, Lisa. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, so Dr. DeSessa, in that paper that you're presenting on today, um, you, you mentioned in the conclusion that all of our various directions, no matter what they might be, will help enrich the horizon for all of us. And um, if we can com com combine that energy from the computational thinking and the coding movements with the insights and directions of computational literacy, um, we might see something even bigger. So a key message as well, I think, is um, to, that you mentioned to think big and ensure our vision is clear, question those assumptions, you know, what fits in, where in the curriculum, and at what age, question the assumptions and the generalizations as well. And as you also mentioned in that paper, you said there's no single recipe, and you kind of touched upon that as well um, later in the questions. And, um, but you say that the effort is worth it, and so we should continue to think big. So thank you very much for, for doing this with us. We look forward to next week, and thank you all for joining us. So we're going to stop the recording, and um, thank that's you, it for tonight. And my thanks also. I was very happy to be here. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Wonderful.